Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, especially to our panelists for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here with us. So we're just going to get right into it and get started. Our first question is, please tell us where you work, the type of law you practice, and give us a quick glimpse into what a typical day looks like for you. And this is open to all of our panelists. I can go first. Um, so I work, my name is Alexandra Bremsky. I'm an attorney with the um, Rockland County Attorney's Office. Um, so what that means is I practice municipal law. Uh, we are the, we represent the county in all of its civil matters. You know, everybody's really familiar with district attorneys. We, we, I'm not an ADA. I was an ADA, I'm now a county attorney. Um, so my typical day is basically the way our office is set up is um, attorneys are assigned essentially like in-house counsel to each of our different county departments. So it's a really great way to learn a lot about a lot of different subjects. So for example, I represent the Board of Elections, I represent the Board of Ethics, I represent Community Development and our um, Human Rights Commission. So I get a lot of really interesting questions. Um, and no day is really the same. So a lot of it is um, resolute writing resolutions, which is really how we get um, sort of legal authority to enter into contracts and sort of um, along those lines. And then a lot of it's also reviewing contracts for the county and then just answering questions that our departments have. And so there's really no typical day. There's a lot of, as I said, crisis management and putting out fires and dealing with um, issues that, that parts of the county have. And then um, in the evenings, a lot of times because we represent boards and commissions and we have to uh, appear at the county legislature sometimes, um, there, there do tend to be evening meetings, but that's kind of sort of a little mini breakdown. Thank you, Alexandra. Anyone can go next. <laughs> okay, I'll go. Um, my name is Stephen DeBraccio. I'm an associate attorney with Burke, Scalamero, and Heard, and I specialize in motions and appeals. Uh, I would say, like Alexandra, I don't necessarily have a typical day. I will say my days are spent largely doing the same activity but not in the same uh, area of law. My day is typically spent drafting motions or appeals. I brought an example with me today. This is a brief. This would be an example of something that I drafted for an appellate court to uh, overturn an adverse ruling in a trial or on a motion. Um, I undertake a lot of legal research basically using legal research tools like Westlaw um, and legal treatises. That's a large part of my day. I do answer questions from the attorneys in my office. We are an office of about 12 attorneys. And so I primarily do their motions and appeals and I'll answer any you know motion and appellate related questions they may have. Um, Sometimes I will go and argue motions or appeals. I've argued in Albany. I've argued it to the fourth department and I've argued in New York City before the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. Thank you, Stephen. Adriel? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, so I guess I'll first start with my title. I'm Assistant Director of Governmental Relations and Public Affairs for the Bar Association, the New York State Bar Association. So essentially what I am is I'm a lobbyist representing attorneys and their interests before the state legislature. I feel uh, that the first thing you kind of need to know if you're looking to become an attorney is that there's really just any kind of practice of law available. You can have you know practice where you're talking to a client over and over and over again. You meet 200 people in a day. You have ones where you meet two or three people a week. So. And there's ones where you know it's all electronic, it's all paper filings on a number of different subjects. So if you're interested in essentially becoming an attorney, you know there's an initial division that happens there, which is civil versus 
criminal. And then, you know, depending upon that initial division, it kind of takes you where you want to go. Who is my client going to be? The city, you know, a private person, an entity, advising other people, whatever. And so I think that that's kind of the, and then the other is the criminal aspect, defense and prosecution. So my typical day, I am, I represent uh, the advocacy interests of a not-for-profit organization of attorneys. And so we essentially develop policy and advocate that policy before the state legislature, drafting memoranda in support of legislation, arguing with stakeholders, uh, sorry, not arguing, advocating to stakeholders, uh, essentially what our positions would be and articulating, you know, who our clients are, which is other attorneys. So, you know, my day-to-day -day, uh, does vary a lot. Um, and depending upon the day of the week, I'll be talking to a person or drafting a report or issuing a memoranda. So it does vary a lot. All right, so we hear a lot about the fact that our country is saturated with lawyers. Do you think that this is still a good field to go into? Yeah, I mean, I do. I, I think if, uh, sorry for jumping on that, uh, you know, Alexandra and Stephen, but, uh, you know, look at the employment rates. Attorneys are getting hired all over the place to represent all different kinds of issues. We are, whether you like it or not, a litigious society. We like to argue about stuff. And we like to advocate in support of our position. And to do that using your rights under the Constitution and the contracts that we operate under, you need an attorney. Drafting the contract, enforcing the contract, even things like, you know, something as simple as like the back of a receipt when you buy something at Best Buy or whatever. That language is written by an attorney. It governs the rules with which you make a purchase. So the world is always going to need attorneys because people haven't figured out how to get along yet, which is where we kind of mend the road there. So I, I agree. I think it's, uh, you know, people seem to be in more disagreement in our country than they've ever been. And I think that that leads to a, a need for attorneys from all different kinds of perspectives. I also think that just it's a really, we have a very complex society and the average person just is not going to be able to figure out how to do a lot of the things that, that have to get done, you know, applying for benefits, um, dealing with somebody's estate after they pass away. I mean, these are things that are going to affect all of us. And without attorneys, you're sort of just left standing there without having an idea of what to do. So I think due to the complexity of, of the world we live in, I think attorneys are, are pretty much, you know, very much needed still, even if there are a lot of us. I saw a really interesting statistic that I just wanted to share leading into this meeting. So essentially Albany has one of the largest saturations of attorneys in the state of New York. The second is the city of New York. And you know our employment rate for the local law school is 87%. So that means basically nine out of 10 people who go and graduate from that program have a job right out of law school. So, and that's in supposedly the most oversaturated market, you know, out there. So it's important to just recognize that, you know, if you're in, that there's more than just district attorneys to public defenders and, you know, you know, private attorneys, it's, there's a wide world out there. So, so oversaturation really is just more specific to what you're interested in. All right. So this next question is for Steven Adriel. Let's say a student has made the decision to pursue a career in law. What would be your advice for tackling, take, tackling the LSATs? Sure. Uh, I would say mainly two things. One, take a number of practice tests. The LSATs are not like any test you'll ever ever taken before. The SATs, for example, gauge, you know, ability and aptitude in subject areas. You know, you can study for them with, you know, you can study for them with your courses, the regents books in high school. The LSAT is not like that. The LSAT measures uh, reading comprehension and problem solving, just an analytical problem solving skills. The best way to go about it in my experience is to take a number of, of practice LSAT tests which I believe are available online, and also seriously consider taking a preparatory course. They are they can be somewhat expensive, but they can make a world of difference in the type you get into, 
or getting in at all. And it's an investment richly worth ma worth making should the law be the, the, the uh, pathway you wish to do. Um, you know, Stephen pretty much hit all of the, you know, all of those. So I'll give some non-traditional advice, I guess I, I would say, you know, get the courses, study hard, put yourself in a, you know, put yourself in a course to success, um, research the test, which means learn how it's constructed. I think that that's something that people don't really realize about the LSAT. So learn, you know, kind of the organism that you're dealing with. And I think that that, that a lot of people who do that first realize it. The second is do a lot, make sure that you are, you know, not everybody has the same access to resources, not everybody has the same family life. So it's important that you do the things that you can to put yourself in a good space. You know, I got a really nice cup of coffee the day of, one that I normally wouldn't get, you know, and the night before I took the day off of work, uh, when I was going to take the LSAT, I took the day off of work, you know, got a, got a nice dinner or whatever you know, and, uh, and, and, you know, made sure that I was in a good mental space and, and doing those things leading up to the LSAT and realizing that, you know, you're there to do your best, but regardless of what the outcome is, there's still a lot of value in you joining the profession. So some people count themselves out based solely upon their LSAT score. Don't do that. Keep going, keep trying. So, you know, if you're wondered, if you take a, a practice LSAT score, you're not necessarily there uh, where, or where you think you should be keep at it, keep trying and, you know, keep your head up, keep going at it. So that, that's what I would say is, is I think perseverance is more important than impact in the initial outset. Thank you. I know myself and a lot of other people here tonight are going to be dealing with that this summer. Looking forward to it. So what can a student do as an undergrad to help them position themselves for success in law school and later as a lawyer? And this is for Alexandra and Stephen. Um, so when I was at UAlbany, I, I participated in the Senate Fellowship Program in my last year, and I thought that was a really amazing experience. And it's really, I mean, the, it was just a really life-changing thing to see how government really works, um, you know, when you're, when you're 20 years old. Um, and we got so much great access to um, state and local politicians, and it was just, I really felt very fortunate to be able to do that. Um, the other thing I did was, and I, I really recommend this to anybody who wants to pursue a legal career is take writing intensive courses. Um, I was a history major. I was um, a Russian major back when there was still a strong Russian program at Albany. And my classes were writing intensive and it really solidified my skills as a good writer. And obviously law school hones that, but whatever you can do to really bulk that up um, undergraduate, I would highly recommend that. And then just finding any sort of activities where you can take a leadership role, where you can work on your public speaking and get comfortable um, dealing with, with other people. I think any of those would really be an asset. I come from a criminal justice background. I largely echo Alexandra's uh, comments, but I also want to add, um, there is a moot court program at Albany, at UAlbany. Um, I believe it's just an inter tournament amongst UAlbany students. They used to compete nationally in the American Collegiate Moot Court Association tournament. That was a, that was a wonderful experience for me. I participated in that my senior year and I would, I, I highly recommend criminal justice classes not so much for necessarily needing to have a criminal justice or policing or criminal attorney background, but there you will undergo case studies. Case study, and I think we'll get to this later in the program, but case study is the backbone of the law school experience. Understanding the law as it develops through cases over time. And a lot of criminal justice classes talk about that, uh, legal classes as well. And one more thing I didn't mention, um, if you can do, if you can do internships, I mean, really, I interned at the Queens DA's office for many, for, for a few summers. It was a great experience. Um, it was very, very low pay, but I was able to um, watch incredible trial attorneys and get a real feel for, I, I originally went into, um, I was a prosecutor right out of law school. So 
it gave me, it solidified my idea that that's what I wanted to do. And um, so if you can do an internship, I know not everybody can um, swing it financially, but if you can do it, I would highly recommend trying to get um, an internship. Thanks. This next question is for Adriel and Alexandra. What do you think is the biggest misconception students sometimes have about law school or just pursuing a career in law? I'm gonna start that you're gonna be rich. <laughs> So I read a public, you know, a public servant, basically my entire legal career. As I said, I worked for the DA's office. Um, I worked for the State Division of Human Rights. I worked for the New York State Liquor Authority. And now I'm working for the county I live in. I am very fortunate to be a public servant and we have great benefits and we have all that other stuff, but I am not driving a luxury car. I am not vacationing in amazing places. It is not necessarily going to make you rich. So um, it has to be something you actually I don't want to say love, but have a, a real passion for or a real interest in doing, um, you know, it, 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 you're not going to necessarily be rolling in, in cash. I, I think one of the biggest, miscon well, that's 100% true. I think that um, most people think that you graduate from, you know, the, the pathway to being a millionaire is you go to like, a tier one law school and you graduate and you get an associate position and suddenly you're driving a Mercedes or whatever. And, you know, I, the truth, the real truth is that most attorneys work very hard for the work, for the jobs that they do and do phenomenal work and receive compensation that doesn't match what that vision is. So I, so I would totally agree. I do also want to say that I think one of the biggest misconceptions is people think that like the person with the biggest bark or the most flamboyant advocacy style is going to be the one that carries the day you have to remember that when you are in law school and all of you who want to be in law school will be in law school if you choose to um, that that your peers will be very smart people who don't who are used to talking to other very smart people so articulating a position cleanly concisely um, rather than with a lot of flair i think is really going to be more more uh, persuasive than maybe what somebody in a, in, a, in a movie would be. I mean, it really is more about knowing your stuff and articulating that 5% that the other person didn't know that is gonna leverage you into success over others. So that's what I think it is, is just knowing your stuff is, is more influential than being a good orator or, or whatever, or having that charisma. I also think, you know, there's a misconception of sort of like the unethical shady lawyer and you're going to see people like that. And I really, it makes me crazy because I work in an office with a number of attorneys. I've worked with numerous attorneys throughout the years. And really, I would say a good 95 to 99% of the people I've worked with, so ethical, really concerned about doing the right thing, that they're staying within, you know, our ethical guidelines as attorneys that you know, that one to 5% of bad apples really do make a bad name for, for the rest of us. So I, I think that's a really common misconception. Yeah, one, one thing off of that real quick, Alexandra, uh, the reason why the ethics matter so much is because uh, becoming an attorney is different than many other types of, of careers. You are tied to the license you have. The credibility you have is attached to your brand and your reputation. And acting ethically is not only a component of maintaining your license, so putting food on the table with the work that you do, but also with being able to establish the relationships you need to be successful. They need to trust that you need to do. So that's one of the other things, the license component. Is practicing or anything? So she can so law school, what would be your biggest piece of advice for succeeding? This is for Stephen and Adriel. I would say, I mean, it's a, it's a silly one, but do your homework. I mean, that's, that's number one. They, they will test you and you will be tested on day one. And I've met a number of students who thought they didn't have to and they regretted it. Um, read, read carefully. Um, you know, people have asked me over the years, you know, what color highlighters to use for cases and things. And I, I tell them not to, not to get bogged down in that. Just get a simple system that works 
Um, you know, it's kind of a grain, grain in the sand tip. But what I used to do, I would underline in red because I, I did I was not going to return my textbooks. I knew that. I, so I'd underline in red what I thought was important. And then I'd go to class and then I'd put blue or black for what the professor thought was important. And oh, what a special day it was, the final day that they finally converged, that we both thought the same things were important. I, I love that advice, the doing your having doing your homework and doing a, and having a system of organization. Those are because nobody's holding your hand through law school. So, you know, did exactly what Stephen said. The, the, the thing that I would just add to that, uh, just as my own little embellishment, is to know that you're going to get it wrong sometimes and, and to have the appreciation that, man, I raised my hand in class. I thought I had it dead to rights. I said the wrong thing, and then, you know, everybody's laughing, but that's not what's happening. Most of them also got it wrong, is really the truth, and you're just the one that was on the hot seat that day. So taking a breath, I'm okay. I'm in law school. I'm a smart person. I'm good at this. I just made a mistake or whatever, and working yourself through that is the best advice for this kind of a format that I would, that I would provide on top of what Steven said, be organized, do your homework, take a breather. All right, so this next question is for Alexandra and Steven. What career mistake, if any, has given you the biggest lesson or taught you the most? So I, I think legal practice is made up of lots of little mistakes usually. Um, and I think I can't point to one huge thing that was, you know, an oh my God, this is gonna ruin me um, mistake. I just think what I learned really early on and I think has been sort of my guiding light throughout my career is owning it, owning it when you, when you mess up, you don't cover it up. I mean, I think people get that sort of panic and they feel like, how are they going to you know, fix this? Oh my God, it's my reputation, it's my license, it's all those things. If you do something, there's usually, and you have smart colleagues, you have people you work with, they're going to help you figure out how to fix it. You need to come clean. You need to figure it out. And I think that ties back into the whole ethics concept of don't do anything that's going to jeopardize, you know, your, your career. And, and you want to be able to go to bed at night and feel like you, you know, you had an honest day's work. You don't want to feel like you're covering, you know, things up or whatever. So I think that, I think that's the only thing, any little tiny thing that happens, it's fixable. I mean, for the most part. So. Yeah, I have one. Here goes. Um, and Adriel hit on this earlier. You know, nobody's holding your hand. Okay. And I say this in no way to brag, but only because it's relevant to this story. Okay. You see my bio. I graduated valedictorian in college and salutatorian in law school. And I had this bright idea that I didn't have to try at my job. I was smart. I had a good GPA. I would just coast on that. And I was wrong. Um, I did not work hard enough. There are a lot of days that got lost to, I'm going to be honest with you, YouTube and just my phone. And I, you know, the official word was my position was eliminated, but everybody in that room knows what happened. And I made it my mission from that day forward that I'd be as hard a worker as anybody else. And it taught me that you know, maybe that first job after that first job, they don't really care what your grade point average was. It's about what do you bring to the table in practice and, and, and do you work hard at your job? And that's, that's a hard lesson. And I, I learned it and I try to do the right things going forward. Thank you. So this question is for Alexandra, but Stephen, Adriel, you can feel free to jump in. Would you agree that law is still a male dominated field? Has that been like your experience? And if so, what advice would you give to the young women on this call right now? Okay, so I started out, I graduated law school in 2003. Um, and as I said, I started out in the DA's office and that was mostly men. It was, there were a few of us who were women, but it was mostly men. However, in my current position, um, there, I was just, I did the numbers before I came on and I realized there are seven female attorneys and three male attorneys. 
And so I don't think it's necessarily male dominated. I do find that mostly leadership roles, um, you know, tend to be male. Uh, judges, a lot of judges still tend to be male. Um, so I think, and it, you know, based on the most recent um, admissions statistics for law schools, I know that it's over 50% of, of, you know, women are being admitted to, to law school. So it's, you know, things are sort of evening out. Um, I think what can't be discounted, and I, you know, I'm a perfect example of this, is women um, get subject sort of to this, the, the family brain drain, which is women a lot of times will leave practice to have a family. And so I took some time off in my career to be with kids. And I'm fortunate that I was able to go back and restart my career and, and, and you know, progress with it. Not everybody does that. I know plenty of, of women attorneys who are amazing, who took time off to be with a family or sort of shifted into a lower gear for their career um, to be with kids and then just have never been able to regain traction. So I, I think those are all um, factors, I think, that affect um, why women don't necessarily have the same sort of leadership management roles in a lot of um, places that I've seen. Okay. What are one or two qualities that you think are essential in a successful lawyer and what advice do you have for students on developing these qualities? And this is open to everyone. Okay, okay. you go. I can only speak to my experience being a litigation attorney. And I just wanna add here, I wanted to say this as to number five, a misconception that students have is that you have to be a litigation attorney. There are a number of positions that you can be as a lawyer that have nothing to do with litigation. Okay, back to this question. Um, analytical problem solving, you know, thinking critically, and those skills get developed through taking writing intensive classes. They get, they get developed through practicing the tests, the LSATs, you know, maybe oral advocacy, doing a moot court competition. And, you know, honestly, go into law school. I mean, it just, it, it's something that takes experience. There's a reason it's three years long and practice, practice, practice. Okay, so um, I think it's pretty obvious that most people who become attorneys really like to hear themselves talk. And I think it's a really important skill to be a really good listener and to be an active listener and actually make sure that what you're listening, you're hearing from your client or from your witness or from whoever is, is actually what they're saying. And if that's gonna um, come across the same way to a, a, a jury or whatever the case is. So I think working on your listening skills and really um, making sure that you're taking in what people are giving you in terms of, of listening. I think that's a really undervalued skill, but it's, I think it's critical to being a good attorney. I do wanna add on to that, uh, just one thing about the listening component. Like some of the best piece of, of advice you're gonna receive as an attorney is gonna happen when you think the person is like chewing you out or like they're doing some of that. Cause really what they're doing is they're prefacing before they provide you like that golden nugget of wisdom is going to stick with you forever that you're going to be like man this person's you know the this person i did something wrong or they did some kind of an issue or whatever and in the end they're you're going to get something that's really actionable out of that so listening i think is so important the last i think is also an empathy component that is really important because at, because we have to negotiate so much in the position that we have and if you're simply negotiating without perceiving the other side, I think that that leaves you uh, blind to places of compromise where everybody will be happy, which is where which is where I think most things happen. Most disputes, I think, resolve themselves through some level of compromise, not through a judge banging a gavel, you know, in a courtroom or something like that. So, honestly, empathy is important as an attorney because you're going to learn so much about where people are coming from. It's going to make you a better negotiator and it's going to make you see things that will previously not be available to you. So, so I would say consider building your empathy skills and, and viewing things from other people's perspective. It will benefit you personally. 
So be selfishly empathetic, I guess is what I'm saying. All right. What advice do you have for current students looking to enter the law field in this current pandemic? This is open to uh, <laughs> so I, I do want to I do want to say this. You're going to have to lean on your network, and the network that you build is going to be through your pre-pandemic and your current pandemic components. My, you know, half of the people I work with I've never met in person. You know what I mean? So you have it's really important for you to be able to build connections through a video screen on the phone via an email, however however that is. So I think that building that network is going to be really critical to employment success. The second is that institutions like you, Albany, like whatever law school you're going to have, are going to have alumni networks and career development programs that are really going to be there to assist in building that network and also in helping you develop the tools that you're going to leverage into a job, a good resume, good interviewing skills, applying timely, places to look. Those kinds of skills are the ones that I think are going to be um, important in getting employed in this post-pandemic world. Stephen or Alexander, anything you want to add? Um, I think it's, you know, the one thing that's been really beneficial during this pandemic is a lot of organizations that don't normally, that normally would charge for CLE have been having free um, web-based CLEs. So you can um, branch out into areas of law that you never really knew about or were interested in or I mean there have been you know with the legalization of marijuana there's been all these really great marijuana CLEs you can sort of there's like a buffet of, of amazing legal education that you can avail yourself of now and I think that's because it's out there and it's free and I, I don't think they limit it to I, I mean most places don't even ask for a bar number they they'll let students um you know participate I would highly recommend, you know, um, New York State Academy trial lawyers and different, your local bar association, whoever the case is, just go see what's out there. There's, you know, figure out what you want to do. It might be over your head, but at least you'll get an idea of something that you might not have ever, ever considered. I'll just talk about, about work, um, you know, because a number, a number of students work, especially before law, just before law school. Um, what I have found that has worked the best for pandemic is keeping your schedule, um, building in time for yourself, taking breaks, going outside, you know, just maintaining that what normalcy you can of the, the, the structure. You know, for me, you know, as silly as it sounds, I would dress in a suit in my living room every day when I was home for two months the pandemic because that was work time. All right, so now this is the last question. What are some things that you wish you had utilized during your time here at UAlbany and some advice for students now to do? This is open to everyone as well. Um, so the one thing I would recommend, I don't have anything, I really loved UAlbany, as I was saying before we started this program, I met my husband at UAlbany, um, it was just, it was a great time, I loved working at the Senate, I had just a really amazing experience, great professors, the whole thing. My recommendation for when you're looking into applying to law school is really research the law school's that you're applying to with regard to financial aid, because it's a really miserable thing to go and get three years of education and then be saddled with huge amounts of debt. So try to sort of gear the schools where you're applying to places where you're in a higher probability of getting some kind of merit-based aid or um, need-based aid or whatever the case is, because who wants to start out their legal career tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt and you're not necessarily going to realize that salary off the bat and it's really crippling and I know people who stayed in jobs far longer that were toxic than they wanted to because they had law school debt um, so whatever you can do I, I mean you may not be applying to the you know if you're not getting into a tier one school find the tier whatever school that will you know likes students that have your major or whatever the case is or your LSAT score and you could end up with a lot of merit-based aid 
and not have to go into debt and you'll have more freedom in your selection of careers and just I, it's it's the only reason I was able to be a prosecutor is because I went to St. John's and St. John's gave merit-based scholarships um, to people with my credentials. And so that was, that gave me freedom. Otherwise I would have had to look into a different kind of career. So that, those are really, do your research on where you apply. Don't just do it because it's a name or, you know, it's close to home or far away from home or whatever the case is, find something, you know, figure out where you fit so you can have the freedom, the three years out to do what you want to do. I think one thing that I wish I had leveraged more at Uolve was the career services program and the alumni network. Cause they, cause there's a lot of lessons that I realized I was supposed to have learned before I tried to make it work in practice. So I graduated from Albany, and then I worked in the real world for a little while and then decided to go back to law school. So some of those skills were harder lessons I learned on the outside after graduation versus going back into academics that I really could have just had from the outset. How to write a good resume, how to submit a cover letter, you know, saving a writing sample and, and making sure that it's the most presentable way, uh, protecting online you know, identity or whatever, you know, the, the brand that you have online. So like these kinds of things that I learned the hard way on the outside, uh, I had to learn on the inside again. So use those networks that your students, they're available to you free of charge. So why not take advantage of them? That's what I would recommend while you're at U Albany. All right, that is all of the questions I, oh, Stephen, were you speaking? I'm sorry. Yes, I was just going to say uh, briefly, uh, my one regret was I did not join student government. And I would encourage to consider student government. Alexandra talked about leadership and Adriel talked about um, skills with alumni and student government's a wonderful way to bridge those. All right. So that is all of the questions that I have for you all today. Now we're going to open up the Q&A to the audience. So anyone who has a question, you can raise your hand. We'll call on you and then you can unmute yourself to ask your question. All right, Sierra. What is one thing you like and dislike about practicing law? Anyone uh, can good answer. I'll just say, um, I'll just say one of the things I really love about practicing law is learning all the different types of law there is. Um, so being able to learn about, you know, people like municipal attorneys versus, you know, all, all these different kinds of practices are, are really fascinating. It, you have a wealth of knowledge with a lot of cool different stuff. I love that. One of the things I dislike about practicing law is that sometimes you get asked questions that don't really have answers. And you have to be the person who gives an answer. And that can be kind of nervous, you know, when you're like, well, I know everything depends upon somebody telling me what to do, but as your legal counsel, I don't really have an answer for you. So you're going to have to kind of make your way through it. And that is always a, a, a nervous, you know, something that sometimes rubs me the wrong way about this practice. I'd like to have the answer. That's why it bothers me. So I, I think clients can be really frustrating. Um, I think it's really tough when you do, you know, research and, and try to examine an issue from all sides and, you know, really try to craft this amazing um, response or whatever the case is uh, for, for your client. And then your client, ultimately, you're just advising them. It's their decision what they want to do. And it can be so painful when you're like watching a slow motion train wreck because your client is your client. There's, I mean, that's, I think that's just an incredibly um, frustrating aspect of, of practicing law. What I love about practicing law, and it's also frustrating, but I do love it, is the fact that it's a, um, it, I love getting into like the nitty gritty of like researching an issue. So you start out in one place and then three hours later, you're like in cases from 1862 and then you're over here and it's just, it's just such a cool, I don't know. I just, I love how 
how it all is so seamlessly interconnected, but it, it, it is like a web and you can get really caught in it. So those are my two things that I would say. My two are largely dovetail with Alexandra's. Um, my biggest dislike are the pitfalls. Alexandra mentioned the nitty gritty. I will, yeah, statutes of limitations, notices of claim, all of these little things that lawyers have to pay very careful attention to and not miss deadlines. What they are basically, folks, is deadlines. Um, but the positive of that, Alexandra also mentioned is earlier, was the colleagues you have to rely on to help you. You know, I take a lot of pride because in my office, I, I'm probably the primary person to help with deadlines. When is this due? What does the law say? Because the difficult thing in law is, especially for, you know, for litigation is, <laughs> my mother has the impression that we just sit around and read law books and find the laws in the books all day. And I have to tell her, well, it's not really on one source and there can be lots of places where deadlines can come up. And it's knowing where all the sources are that, you know, makes the practice of law so rewarding. Thank you. Uh, I see Greg Joseph. Hi, this is a question for all of you. I was just wondering, did you always have an idea of what kind of law you wanted to practice or did you kind of just fall into the, the position after graduating from law school? Okay, I'll start. So I, um, as I said, I started out as, as a prosecutor and I was really focused my career. I, all through law school, I did um, St. John's at this amazing prosecutor's clinic where you were working in the Queens DA's office. I did trial advocacy. I was very focused on being an ADA and I did that and I, I liked it when I was doing it. Um, and I took time off to have kids. I have four children and I went back to work when my youngest was three. And so it was very frightening to have to go back into the career field. So what I did was I applied through New York State Civil Service um, for a job and it's something that I think people coming right out of law school don't necessarily think about because it's not your traditional legal career. And it's also not really like a sexy kind of career, but what it is is you basically submit your qualifications, um, your experiences to um, the state. They score you based on those qualifications. And then based on what your score is, you will get notices as to different kinds of jobs. And so I ended up, that's how I ended up with my job at Division of Human Rights. That's how I ended up with my job at the New York State Liquor Authority. And those are areas I would have never necessarily gone into. Um, so it, I sort of had a really roundabout convoluted way of, of ending up where I am now. Um, but it's, you don't have to take the traditional path of graduating and then either becoming an ADA or working at a firm or whatever the case is. There's lots of different ways to be a lawyer. Yeah, I'll, I'll, oh, well, I was, not, what I was going to say is I was going to become, I was like, I went to law school and I was like, I'm going to be a med mal attorney. I'm going to sue doctors and defend doctors and all this other kind of stuff. And I had this vision that was totally not right. And I didn't realize it. Like I, I took all, all the courses, my, re, my, my law school courses, you know, just a what's what of courses to take as a medical malpractice attorney. And so, um, I got the offer and I had a reckoning with myself to realize I really like had the offer and declined the offer to be like, I didn't want to do this. This isn't what I want to do. And uh, I was fortunate enough to have done some other cool stuff. And that led me to have a connection with a lobbying firm. And that's where I first made my avenues into the practice. So, you know, academically, you know, I scare a doctor. But in terms of practice, I've never appeared in a courtroom. And I think that you really learn that, that there's a moment where many attorneys get that offer letter and they're like, yes, this is everything I want. And I was one of the people that got that offer letter and was like, nope, I'm going to turn down the name that I've been pursuing for three years. 
the type of law I've been pursuing for a while and do something different. And that was scary, but I realized, but I think you will realize that in yourself too, when you make the choice, whether it's the right fit or whether it's not. And I think that, that that's just something you'll figure out for yourself. Um, some people know what they're going to do and other people think they know what they're going to do. And, and I think that that's most of us. I got to be honest with you. I had a, I had a pretty direct path. I wanted to be a lawyer since I was 11. Um, constitutional rights was my thing. I, the only thing I differed on was whether I'd be a, a district, an ADA or a private attorney. I wanted to be an ADA in law school, did a lot of work with criminal procedure, just kind of soured of criminal law and then moved into the civil, civil law field. But I'll tell you, my favorite cases are still constitutional civil rights cases. All right, Anthony Scandariato. Yeah, so um, I guess part of my initial question was partially answered, but I was wondering if like you guys knew from high school that you wanted to be an attorney and like if you guys changed like majors in college to pursue law. So I wanted to be a doctor <laughs> and, and then organic chemistry and I were not friends. <laughs> and so I switched paths pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, I, I really saw myself as, as going to medical school and becoming, you know, a, a physician and that I had to pivot. And I think that's just a really great skill to have if you're going to go into the legal profession is the ability to pivot and to be flexible. So I don't, I'm not sure that there's a specific major that, I mean, like writing intensive majors, I think are really useful for, for seamlessly transitioning into just the fire hose of writing you have to do in law school, um, as well as reading, just mountains of reading. And I think, so I think that those in and of themselves are assistive. I was an econ major, which is not, you know, it's, I guess it's a kind of a traditional major. But you know you have all different kinds uh, of of majors, so I, I'm not sure the major itself is as important as whether or not you have the skills from that major to to transition to law school. I want to just say, you know, real quick, you know, what I my last answer. Yes, I had a direct path to law school, and it does not matter one iota if your path to law school is direct or not. You know, I had a classmate who had a degree in music theory and she was one of the best students in law school so you know it's all about that critical thinking that we were talking about earlier tonight that's really what made the difference all right Arnell. yes hi um i was actually wondering if any of you guys took a gap year between your undergrad and law school and if you did what particularly you did during that time and whether you think it would be beneficial. So I did take a gap year. I don't know if Steven or if Alexandra, either of you did. Okay. So I did take a gap year. I took, uh, let's see, geez, five years, I guess, five years after undergrad. And uh, I did nothing important. It was really just working <laughs> for, for a normal company, you know, doing normal company stuff. So I really what I'm, but the thing is, is that at that time, I graduated undergrad and I realized that I didn't think I was ready for it. I kind of needed to, I wanted a break, you know, whatever. And, uh, and I looked back on it and I was like, yeah, I could have done it. But I'm glad that I took the time off because I learned so much more about myself and, um, and then was able to take those skills into law school. I found that you know, dealing with supervisors was a lot easier for me because I had had bad and good bosses, uh, you know, dealing with some of the obligations of working with others, you know, so somebody described that um, non-traditional students uh, who, uh, who don't go directly from undergrad to, to law school play well with others is the way that, that she described it, meaning that they can resolve conflicts, they kind of see you know, they see the forest for the trees that, you know, just because you disagree with someone doesn't mean you hate their guts. And I think that that gap year, I think, built a lot of that maturity. So I did not take a gap year. I finished college and went right into law school and was done as soon as I could be done. 
But I have my husband actually is also a lawyer. So you can feel sorry for my children coming from a two lawyer household. Um, but he went after going to, he was, was in the Navy for four years. And then he went to business school. And when he was in business school, he realized that he really also wanted to get his law degree. So he was working full time and got his JD at night. And his grades kicked my grades butt because he took it so much more seriously because he wasn't going right from undergrad into, um, into law school. And he was just such a more focused and more diligent student and really just was amazing. And I think it's because that extra bit of maturity of having had the career, of having had supervisors, of having had the responsibility um, that he just, it, it was just a better fit for him at that point. Um, so I think, you know, either way you do it um, is fine, but don't be afraid of taking that time between undergrad and, and going to law school. I echo um, Adriel and Alexandra's comments. Um, all I'll say is, no, I did not take a gap year. I in fact shortened my college education by a year to go to law school. Um, and I will tell you that, you know, we talked about my first job, my first real job out of law school. You know, a lot of that also is gaps in being a good employee. And that's something that Adriel's, for example, Adriel's work experience, I'm sure taught him that I did not have and, and developing those employee skills. It's not enough just to be able to brief cases and, you know, write memos, you have to be a good employee too. All right, Mia. Also, everyone in the audience, you can turn your camera on when you ask your question if you want. I just noticed everyone has their cameras off. <laughs> Hi, um, so my question was, has there been um, a specific moment or just like a period of time in your career which kind of made you rethink your career um, in the law field? No. No, no, I, I have not. I've, uh, I, and, and I feel very blessed that way. You know, I, it's something I always wanted to do. There was no plan B. And, and that's not to say that if you do have those moments that there's anything wrong, it's just, you know, you strive to find that, that career path that, that sustains you. And that's what it was for me. Uh, I, I, I think you have those, but they're, I think that many people have them, um, but they're more micro, I guess is what I would say. You'll be like, man, I really hate this case or man, I really hate this issue that I'm on. I wish I was doing X. Right. And I think that the nice thing about most practitioners is that they're not steeped in one specific issue all day, every day just that one issue all day, every day. And, I, and that's important. Um, uh, and I think that that's just important because, uh, uh, because it keeps things fresh and avoids some of those. I think what we're really talking about is some of the burnout. And I think that that freshness in the practice really keeps, really keeps that burnout from it. You do have crisis moments where you're like, man, am I doing the right thing, I think. Um, but I do think that most people but I haven't had one where I've rethought my career entirely as an attorney. Um, I think that you learn to make decisions through a sober lens with critical thinking built in, and that includes your employment decisions, I think, oftentimes. But sometimes you have an employer that's toxic and you never would have known that, or sometimes it's not a good fit for a number of other reasons. And I think that that more educates you more than shakes your resolve in the practice. I mean, I went back to practicing law after a large gap. So I, I went through all of that. What am I doing? Do I need to requalify myself? Should I be doing something different um, when my kids were little? Um, and ultimately I decided, you know, this is it. Going to law school, I don't think anybody, you don't understand until you do it. I think 
it trains your brain and it trains the way you think in such a way that you're forever changed. So even if you don't practice law, when you're done with law school, even if you're doing something else, it's just you're, you think differently, you, you examine things differently. And ultimately, I did end up practicing law after going back to work, but I knew that what the skill set that I'd had and the experience that I'd had would really translate into so many other fields because of my my legal training. So, I mean, I, I think you do it, have these little doubtful moments, but ultimately um, there are aspects that are so rewarding that, that it, it makes it worth it in the end. All right, we have a question in the chat. What do you enjoy most about your career and what makes you so passionate about law? I like problem solving. So that's what makes me passionate. I like seeing something that's an issue or having somebody coming to me and saying, Alex, you know, we got a letter from this federal agency and they found this problem and we're going to have to, you know, litigate this whole thing and sort of finding the workaround or finding a way to settle it or mitigate it and all of that. And I just, so I, I am, my father was an immigrant. Um, I grew up with all my grandparents were immigrants. And so um, from the former Soviet Union. And so the concept of like coming to America and understanding how America worked was very hard for us in a lot of ways because it's so different than what they were used to. And the idea that there's like a legal system that actually, for the most part, I mean, I'm not gonna deny that there are huge, huge gaps and flaws, but for the most part, it works the way you think it's supposed to. And I just really love the idea of, of having even more of that insider knowledge of understanding how it works and being able to, you know, figure something out like what happens when somebody dies and you have a will to probate or what happens when, you know, if you're coming from that, that sort of immigrant mindset, I know at least from my side of things, it was like, how do we do this? I don't know how to do this. And so being that person for my community and being that person for my family has, has really meant a lot to me. And that also keeps me very passionate about being a lawyer. My passion, um, not to interrupt Adriel, but my passion is legal research. Um, over there in my office is a bobblehead that a friend of mine gave me of just Chief Justice John Roberts. My favorite justice was Anthony Scalia. I would love to be on the Supreme Court one day, but you know, Washington hasn't quite gotten back to me about that yet. So, but I take so much pride in knowing that on, a, on just a little level, I'm doing the same work that the Supreme Court is doing. You know, not at the constitutional national level, but just like, is this complaint timely? Is this issue, you know, whatever the issue is, I'm doing the same process that they do, going through the, the cases, going through the treatises, and just doing the legal research, you know, what Justice Scalia called the lawyer's work. That's not to denigrate anybody else's work, but just that thing that people think of when they think of the Supreme Court, that kind of research. I love... My mine is a little less traditional legal work. You know, I'm a lobbyist, so we're working about writing the laws and amending the laws. So, you know, it's a different perspective than what I think many of my peers are looking at when it comes to case law interpretation. Um, so I have a, I have a little bit different perspective. But what I'm most but that affords me the luxury of asking a question that many attorneys don't get to ask, which is what should the law be not what is a law, what should it be? And being able to look at a problem, something that I'm very, there are many things that I'm very passionate about through my personal interests that don't get a chance to be expressed through the work that I do, but being able to win those, when the alignment of something that I'm personally passionate about and the ability to say, what should something be? And when those two things collide, that is like, it's, it's music. I mean, it's the most rewarding thing when you put a piece of, when, you know, when I do something and, you know, the other day we wrote amendments to a language that would create, some, that would create something without going into the specifics. And you just like, look at it and you're like, that's me. I wrote that. Like there was a blank page in word on my computer and I wrote the thing 
and it's in the thing and like people are going to get the thing because of that and so it's like you know the that passion that you get from getting a case dismissed that you've been wanting to get dismissed getting the judgment that you're looking for inking that contract that you've been fighting over talking to the person and having good news for them telling the the municipality that you're going to save something winning something on appeal and there's just so many ways to win here and having the passion for to pursue that problem that you have is the thing that really drives me so that's so that's what i enjoy about law i guess is is the creative problem solving to the degree that that you have the opportunity for it Great. that was a good question <laughs> brandon um hi so with you Albany offering the four plus one program like with the bachelor's and master's would it be better to go to go into law school with a master's degree or does it not matter if you just if you have an undergrad uh, so i actually had a couple maybe maybe you guys did too but a couple of my friends took master's programs while they were in law school and i also have other friends who had master's degrees in various areas before they entered into law school um i don't know how much having a master's degree makes you a more competitive candidate for law school because I think really they are looking for things like the LSAT and some of the other factors that they evaluate, your GPA, the, those kinds of things when it comes to, to entering in over just having a master's degree. Um, you, you want some of the programs as beneficial as they are. Sometimes, you know, you have to assign yourself to a specific program. You can only get your master's from this one, from this one college. And I'm not sure how that has played out for some of my for some of my friends to their benefit. But I have seen other people who do things like get a, they're a social worker and then they enter into the they enter into law school and the connection between the work that they do for their master's degree to become a social worker uh, and to become an attorney marries quite well in terms of the benefits and the legal rights that they're defending on behalf of their clients. So I think for the right person, it, it really does make a difference after law school not necessarily getting into law school. I, I also think if you're interested in certain niche fields within the legal profession, like for instance, my sister is a librarian and she actually has her master's in information science from, from UAlbany. And so if you were interested in possibly becoming a legal librarian, which is a very niche field, you could get you know your master's in information science and then go to law school because you need all those qualifications to be a, a law librarian. But that I think in those if you can form sort of your unique path using that, that would probably be the most to your benefit. Brandon, if you are interested in becoming a patent attorney, um, that's also very important to know. Some spe specifically being a patent attorney requires you to have, and I, I can't recite it to you right now, but specifically requires you to have some kind of a master's or a STEM, le a STEM level education. And for many people, they don't want to go back to their undergrad to get another undergrad and a qualifying one to become a patent attorney. So there are, you know, if you have a very specific interest uh, or a niche interest, find a person who practices in that area and straight up ask them, do I need to get this master's degree? Do I need to get this specific bachelor's degree? Because I think that, that you'll find a more informative answer there. Um, than a general just get a master's or whatever for, for law school. That's my opinion. All right, are there any other questions anyone in the audience has? If not, I have one last question for you guys. Just the biggest piece of advice you guys could give us right now. Pick it out, keep fighting. You, you can't give up. Your clients are not going to expect you to give up. You can't give up on yourself. You got to keep fighting. So if you have a bad day, if you get knocked down in round one, pick up, go back for the next rings of the bell. Perfect is the enemy of good. There's only so many hours in the day. You can't spend 300 hours on a five page uh, assignment. And I think this is just, it's not just for legal, you know, careers, it's for life. Find a sounding board, find someone in your life that you can spitball with, that you can, if you're in the legal profession, you know, talk about a case with somebody that you can discuss your future plans with, who's 
whose opinion you respect and whom you trust and having that sort of a confidant in your life and somebody that you can really, whose opinion means something to you and that you feel is, is going to help guide you. Um, it's, it's a really critical thing um, as you progress throughout your career. All right, so if there are no other questions, thank you so much everyone for coming tonight. Thank you to our panelists for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here. If you guys would like to connect more with alumni lawyers, you guys can check out you can the UAlbany Career Advisory Network at www.alumni.albany.edu slash you can. And if you guys are interested in more programs like these, stay tuned, File for Delta will be having more of these next semester in the fall. Thank you so much, everyone.